Thank you, Joanne, for that amazing introduction and indeed for corralling us all today. It's been an incredible event uh, this year as indeed last year. It's an absolute pleasure to introduce our panellists today. Um, and we're going to, we were talking for about 50 minutes because two of them have to catch a train, public transport sustainability. Uh, so it'll be 50 minutes rather than an hour. So we'll make it, we'll, we'll get, get through what we need to get through. We want to hear from you as well. Um, so I'm really delighted to introduce uh, Caroline Lucas, who's, Caroline, this is your third event of today, yes. so uh, <laughs> hats off to you. Um, Caroline, of course, the Green Party MP for Brighton Pavilion, former leader and co-leader of the Green Party, chair of the all-party parliamentary group on climate change, member of parliamentary, Parliament's so Environment Audit Com Committee, and the UK Trade and Business Commission. Uh, and one of the environment agency's top 10 eco heroes of all, top 100 eco heroes of all time, um, Caroline Lucas. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and next to Caroline, Mary Colwell, who's an author, producer, and campaigner for Nature. She spearheaded, uh, along with others, the uh, the establishment of the GCSE in natural history, which is due to come on the books uh, uh, next year, I believe. Year after. Yep, year, year after. Okay, well, to be debated. Uh, and uh, <laughs> has made many documentaries for the BBC Natural History Unit. She's also published three books, which are available outside on the Red Line uh, book stand, and uh, has uh, a, a particular expertise in curlews and, uh, and has uh, the, recently been awarded the, um, an RSPB medal for um, science communication. So Mary Colwell, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, to, her, to her right there is uh, Tim Oates, who's the Group Director of Assessment Research and Development at the Cambridge Assessment. Uh, just Cambridge Assessment, isn't it? Yeah, that's all it is. Cambridge Assessment, and it's, he's an expert on curriculum design and assessment, and he advises the UK government on the national curriculum. So any teachers in today? Uh, oh, OK, so you might want to... Uh, Tim's not catching a train, so you might like to <laughs> shut that door and, uh, and catch him. Uh, and uh, he's uh, also an expert in international uh, systems and we might talk about the, uh, how the UK compares to other systems as well and was awarded CBE for services to education in 2015, I believe. So, Tim Oates. Um, and my, my opening question to, to the panel, and we're talking about reframing education, is what was your favourite subject at school? Hands up. <laughs> English literature. English literature, okay. Geology. Geology, okay. I'm looking at the audience. There's some nods there, yes. And uh, ancient history. Okay, so we've got a full, full, uh, full <laughs> panel here of, uh, of thoughts. Um, and we have got a number of people working in education with us today, and we do want to hear from you, as we will be leaving at least 20 minutes or so for questions. So start getting those, those questions going, and indeed, you know, we don't have to have worked in schools to ask a question. Um, we're talking about reframing education. We're going to start with the Natural History GCSE, and I'm going to come to Mary first. Um, tell us about the new GCSE in Natural History and what you hope it will achieve. What I hope it will achieve is will give young people uh, the skills to identify, sort of name, identify, monitor uh, through the seasons, the wildlife around them. So it's very much what you see every day and trying to make that connection between what you see every day, the habitat it lives in and the health of that habitat. So it's real, real nitty gritty local natural history and then place that in a much bigger context. So start little get big, and that's what I hope. So we'll produce or start to produce a pipeline of naturalists. Okay. And why do you think we need a qualification in it as opposed to encouraging people to go and explore the natural world? What's the? Well, we can do that, mm -hmm. but that would be very random, I think. And uh, some kids get lots of opportunity to go and they're lucky enough to have parents that are interested or take them, but not everybody has that. And um, I live right in the centre of Bristol and there's a very city centre school very close to my house. And uh, I think for some of the kids that go to and from that school, it's probably very little access to the countryside. Um, and so everybody, every child, has a right to know about the natural world and, it's under and understand its importance to us. And that's why. I think it's been quite a journey. How, how did it begin? <laughs> I'm only 20. And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was quite a journey. Yeah. Oh, yes. 
<laughs> yeah. 12, 12 years. 12 years. Yeah. Okay. From when I first came up with the idea to um, when the government announced it in April last year. So uh, it was, you know, lots and lots of highs and lows. It got much easier when these two guys got involved, which was brilliant in 2018. Um, but it's, uh, it's just a matter of not letting anything stop you. If you just have a vision, and that, that was my vision, to, to give the next generation that wonder, that sense of love and awe of nature, mm -hmm. and, uh, and on top of that, the importance of it. Um, if you have that vision, I didn't want anything to stop me. So no matter who said no, no matter who said go away, you know, you just keep going. I can reinforce that, okay. she does. <laughs> But it was a conversation with Tony Juniper, wasn't it? That, it, that was the original yeah. thing. I just uh, I was happened to be in a meeting with Tony Juniper, who wasn't chair of Natural England at the time. Actually, I think think he was. I don't know what he was doing, but he was a big environmentalist. I'm sitting next to you. Yeah, and he just happened to be sitting <laughs> next to me, and um, and I. It just came out. It must have been sort of like I don't yeah. know. Was it fermenting, or I don't know what the right word is, but growing the idea, and that just suddenly I said we need a GCSE in natural history, and that's the first time I verbalised it and put it in a package, so okay. to speak. So. Tim, could you talk us through this, how, you, how do you get something on the curriculum? How do you go from an idea to it being on the national curriculum? What's Before, I, I, yeah. will, I will answer you that will. question. Okay. But I just add a bit, and maybe Caroline would like to come in too. Just to add to what Mary was saying about well, why, and I think we're seeing a rising environmental concern, anxiety, and consciousness in young people. Mm. And as that's rising, their knowledge and contact with nature is declining. And that, mm. that's, that's a pretty toxic combination, actually. Mm. Now, I think one of the things we want to do is... is you, you can't see things unless you've got knowledge. They're just passing stuff. You know, I once, I once skied past something, and, and somebody said, well, what is it? I said, it's only a rock. The other thing is, I was skiing with a geologist. <laughs> 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 Big mistake. <laughs> Okay, so, so it's, it's ways of seeing mm. and, way, and therefore ways of understanding and therefore ways of loving and respecting and protecting. And that, that we've t we, all three of us have talked about that a lot. Sure, Caroline, you well, I was just going to say there's that lovely quote that I think is from uh, Richard Louvre, that last child in the wood, where he says, we won't protect what we don't love yeah. and we won't love what we don't know mm. and, we won't, and, we don't, and we won't know what we don't touch and feel and taste and smell and, and so forth. And that to me seems so important just to kind of close that, mm. that loop. And just to say as well, just maybe apropos of um, a kind of theme that's been going through this morning about the arts and um, in Mary's original conception of, of this GCSE, um, it was going to have an arts component. And I, I must say, I feel sorry that it doesn't anymore because I would love to have had within this GCSE the idea of people studying Wordsworth or mm. John Clare or whoever else, you know, because it feels to me unless we... One of the bigger things I'm sure we'll come on to talk about in a moment is about reconnecting different bits on the curriculum. And we are so siloed, so mm. um, mono-visioned that the more we can make those connections, I think that would have made it an even more amazing yeah. GCSE than it already is. Mm. Yeah, and in terms of subjects and schools, I mean, I was, I was a pretty feral child from a very early age. <laughs> but part of my feralness was just going through all the books that we had in our house. And, and, and when I came across those books of Victorian prints, illustrations mm. of, of different organisms. I mean, there was one on, on mosses. You know, it just opened my eyes because th th these, were, these were beautiful plates of mosses, but, but, uh, but obviously magnified massively. And it was a world that I then entered with a magnifying glass outside. And it was in an urban environment. You could find it. it you didn't have to go to the countryside to discover this. And, and ways of seeing through art and literature, I think, are critical. And we really wanted to have that in the GCSE. And one of the anecdotes, you always had to prepare anecdotes to try to convince politicians. <laughs> I mean, you have to have the quick anecdote that kind of flips them. And the one I'd prepared on that was, was Leonardo, uh, there was a medic going through Leonardo da Vinci's drawings. And, and he looked at one that Leonardo da Vinci had done of a human knee. And he said, that's wrong. Uh, that's, he's labelled something that that's not real. Anyway, he then looked, and it's been an overlooked ligament <laughs> that no, nobody has taught right. in anatomy, yep. in medicine, since that observation <laughs> by da Vinci. Mm. Okay. Now, that's what's extraordinary about building in an art and a literature component 
because it helps with ways of seeing. Mm. The, the fact that it's not, it, it was kind of scrapped, red penned out um, doesn't mean that teachers can't include it in the learning. And if we've got good learning materials, digital and paper, good staff development, which you really emphasise, Mary, that can be there too. Sure. And I, everything you're saying, I'm sure, resonates with many people here about children aren't free to roam as they once were, perhaps for good reason, but also their lives are quite restricted in terms of their ability to go out about on their own. We were organising a um, capture the flag party for my son in the woods for his birthday. Had a group of year six kids down. And one of the boys said, all running around the woods, you know, face paint and flags. One of them said, can anyone come here? How did you book it? <laughs> <laughs> and this, this was Wivenhoe Woods. Um, you know, I'd like to come back next week, like Jump Street, where do you pay? Yeah. So that was a really uh, uh, sad, sad but comment I never forgot. Um, ha uh, to play devil's advocate on the title, um, Natural History GCSE, um, would it be more accessible to more people if it was called environmental science? No. No, no okay. <laughs> we, we've been there so much. I'm sure. Time, okay, so God, would you, you rename the Natural History Museum in London the Environmental ah, Science Museum? Yeah. Or would you rename the BBC Natural History Unit the Environmental Science Unit? Because natural history is a wonderful title. It has a, a real history, it has a real integrity to it, and we need to rediscover it. It means the study of natural mm. history. Yeah. That's what it needs, the study of nature. Yes. And so uh, we need to, to reinvigorate it and, and get people to understand what it actually means yes. again. So definitely, definitely. I'm not. just remembering that, you know, the school gym of Philip Morant with all the on options night when you went to talk to all the teachers and all the subject headings were there and business studies and sports science and, and natural history. I'm just wondering how that would play in the majority of schools. I, I, I well, we do know, I think we know that. Oh, yeah. So, so one, on, on the name, it, it, right from the outset, people have said, are you sure the name's right? It sounds a bit old fashioned. Um, and then when we've explained what it is and why, they say, oh, it's probably natural history then, isn't it? Oh, yeah. so, so there is a communication job to yes. be done. Yes. Um, but the consultation, the OCR, the board, which is part of Cambridge University Press and Assessment, uh, which, which provides domestic qualifications, which will be running this qualification in England, uh, ran a consultation. We had over 2,000 responses. Mm. And, and there was a ringing endorsement of the title. Mm. And also, it, it, it was, it, it's been extraordinary, actually, for, for older kids and parents and teachers, whenever we talk to them about making it available, they all say the same thing, I wish I'd been able to do it at mm. school. Mm. I mean, it is absolutely universal. And, and it's a consultation where we've never had such positive mm. responses of that yes. kind in any other consultation over a qualification. I think the title as well helps to distinguish it from biology, and maybe Mary in a second can give you a lovely definition, but as I understand it, biology is much more around the... The, the sort of life systems and processes rather than the individual components, the life itself, but you can explain better. But it's one of the things that um, people do raise, saying, mm. well, isn't this all yeah. already dealt with in biology? And I think by, by keeping that, that title of natural history, it does make it yeah. more specific. I just think natural history is... Uh, we, we've lost that communication with the natural world, so much so that we don't even know what natural history is anymore. Most people don't know what it is. And we have a big job to do to bring it back and really celebrate it mm -hmm. and love it again. Because it's about individuals. It's about that flower, that bird, that, you know, habitat that I go to every day. It's about that. Um, and it's not about... We can know all about photosynthesis or the nutrient cycle... Mm. But you don't necessarily, you can say, I know about photosynthesis, but you won't know what plant you're talking mm. about. We want to know what that plant is, because that plant's really important to be able to name it, to know it, to have a relationship with it. And when you start to monitor individuals like that through the year, and we've got some really great naturalists in the audience, Mark Cocker, I'm sure, will agree with me with this, that, that once you have a relationship with nature, you notice stuff. Mm. And nature is telling us so much important stuff about what's happening to the world around us. Not only gives us all that joy and wonder that we, that we so need desperately in our lives, but it's telling us important facts about how the world is functioning. And unless we have people who can see that, read it, have that language, have that conversation with nature, we'll miss so much. 
Mm. As well, I, I, it was interesting you said, why don't we call it environmental science? Because environment is different. Environment is a huge big term that covers climate change and all sorts of <laughs> habitat loss. It, it's massive. Natural history is very specific. And so it, it's a bit like, I, I try and explain it in a bit like saying, you want everybody to be really expert French chefs, but people don't even know what an egg is. Mm. You know, so you've got to get back right down to the basics, mm. get everybody understanding what they're living in the midst of, how what they're living on, in the midst of works, and then we can start to decide how best to do it. But at the moment, it's all let's have big environmental solutions, but people, I don't think, and I put myself in this category mm. actually, don't know enough about it to raise it up to the level to make the right decisions for the future. Mm -hmm. I think it's really yeah. important. And so you asked a question about the processes. I mean, it, mm. it, and I, I wasn't flippant when I talked about anecdotes. So when you're dealing with ministers and civil servants who are trying to make a decision as to whether they should, should admit a new qualification to the National Catalogue, because mm. a lot of qualifications have been stripped out over the last couple of decades to try to make the landscape a bit, a bit tidier. Um, and very few qualifications have been approved in the last 12-15 uh, mm. years. Uh, and, and alongside British Sign Language, this is going to be one of the first for a very long time. So these, this issue of, of overlap with other subjects is not just a technical question, it, it's also a political one because the, those, those other subject communities are very protective of their qualifications and their subjects. So the, inter the, inter the interface with other subjects is very important. So the geography, biology, obviously big discussions. And, and when we went to see the then minister in charge of making the decision around the time of the, the announcement of the Natural History Museum by Nadim Zahawi, we had prepared all sorts of stuff. And one of them was on exactly this. Well, what about the link with biology? Sure, it's just going to do stuff which is in biology. And um, you just completely failed to achieve it. What I, what I, what I, the task I set you, Caroline, which was to get the word axolotl into Hansard. <laughs> There's still time. Yeah, OK. <laughs> That's true. I shall continue to pressure you on that. So what, what, what I did is I just, in preparation for the me meeting with the minister, I looked at biology GCSE papers. And the first question that came up was on axolotls. And there was a picture of an axolotl. There it was, outline picture, you can imagine it. First question. <laughs> I could imagine that not everybody can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The uninitiated. Yeah. You just anybody, <laughs> a bit, anybody knows what? Ax, hands up, Axel? Okay. Yeah, that's enough. Just talk to the person next to you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, very small, cute looking, mute like uh, uh, organism that lives in canals <laughs> at altitude in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. Shame on you if you okay. Okay. know that. So, there, there is a very cute, smiley axolotl picture. First question, axolotls have gills. What is the function of gills? Mm. Now, all the questions were like that. Nothing about what, what, you know, the organism itself or where it was, what, the habitat in which it existed, its behavior, its interaction with other species, the pressures, and so on and so on. N none of that's in biology. But it is in natural history. Mm. And, and therefore, it's highly complementary. Mm. And the biologists should stop fretting about it because I just think more people are going to do A level biology as a result. If as they a way do into natural history. sciences, yeah. GCS. I'd like them to do yeah. A level natural history, actually. Yeah, well, <laughs> oh, that's, that's, the next, that's the next one. Well, <laughs> uh, that's <laughs> the next 11 <laughs> years. That's the next campaign. So we think that this is going to come on, on stream in 2025, six. Well, we all thought 25, but my goodness, it's been slow, hasn't it? Okay. There, there is a process, and the process is complex and lots of steps, but I can summarise it very quickly. In the past, an exam board would say, with, with a, a school would say, we need, we've got a great bit of the curriculum, can you help us develop a qualification for it? And an exam board would come along and say, yes, and therefore we, we, we had loads of brilliant qualifications mm -hmm. in our system. For good reasons, we've now got exams regulation, and that's increased the power of the state, and so therefore the state has more of a role in, in controlling qualifications. So now there's more a process of a, a group or people saying, we need this, uh, you have to put a case to government, government has to decide that there is a case, 
then you put together something called subject criteria. Those have to be approved, which kind of defines the domain. And then after a series of discussions and consult public con consultations, awarding bodies are asked to develop the specific GCSEs, which are then made available. Yeah. But you can tell there are lots of steps. Yes. And yeah, those indeed. steps can often be quite... OK, low. I'm going to move us on to... Um, other parts of the curriculum and, other, and, and the notion of reframing education. That's a, a fascinating, important discussion of, of a landmark moment in, in uh, our, our educational history. And thank you for your efforts on, on, on that. Um, thinking about the, the other kinds of values, skills, competencies we might need in order to be able to equip young people to handle climate change and biodiversity loss. They might include things like um, revaluing uh, the, you know, the public realm, the notion of public goods, collectivism, long-term thinking. What else do we need to be doing in, in schools or beyond schools to encourage that? We'll come to you, Carolyn. Well, I think, first of all, as well as needing the self-standing GCSE in natural history, then, then some of that thinking does need to go through all of the different... Um, curriculum subjects because not everyone is going to take the natural history GCSE but, but mm. everyone needs to have at least some basic understanding of 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 the world around them and, and, the, and the species with which we are privileged to share this planet so I think part of it is about the mainstreaming mm. of I mean I'm, I'm talking more perhaps more broadly than natural history but more of the of the environmental perspective in mm. in, in everything um, and I think that it's also about lots of, of practical skills as well. Um, I mean, it's, it's really clear that we are living through an incredible emergency and it feels like the curriculum is still kind of somewhere over here, equipping people for a world that probably isn't going to exist in anything like the way it does today. And mm. so once you've factored things like AI into it as well, it feels to me that we, we need to be teaching young people some of those um, qualities around resilience or compassion or some practical skills mm. and being slightly less obsessed by, by just getting people through the, through the latest exam. Mm. And there was that nice quote from Yates, isn't there, about education being, a, 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 being about lighting a fire rather than filling a bucket. And lighting that fire to mm. me is about lighting the hunger in, in, in young people to find things out for themselves, to come to terms with the world as they're going to find it, and having the skills then that they need to be able to deal with that. And those skills, I think, are going to be more, more than ever cross-curricular. I mean, they're, not, they're, not, they're going to be much less about specific subjects mm. overall, although that's going to be important. So I think, I think a lot of it's going to be about resilience, cooperation, some of those, some of those values that we're, we're going to need in the next decades more than we ever have done before. And it seems to me that the education system, and I'm a part of that in the university sector, is very much around um, personal advancement, you know, getting your grades to get your qualifications to get a job, and universities are uh, ranked yeah, exactly. on employability. And the, whole, and the whole Ofsted process, yeah. in my view, reinforces yeah. that. I mean, it's often not necessarily measuring the stuff that's really going to matter, mm. and it's frankly, alongside causing a huge amount of anxiety and time distraction into the process. So I would like to see us get rid of some of those inspections um, mm. and tr trusting teachers more um, and using that time to, to properly equip young people to navigate the world they're going to be living in rather than working out how to pass the latest exam in order for the school to be able to have a better Ofsted result mm. in order to fill you know, the next hole in the economy that's been identified. Mm. I mean, it feels to me that education is so much wider than what, we're, what young people most of the time are being taught in schools. And if we, can, if we can engender that sense of that fire being lit in young people for them to want to know more, wherever they find that information, that feels to me a, a, a whole lot more important mm. than teaching them to, sure. to pass an exam. Let me invite Mary Tim to comment on that. I think the, the word I think that we'll hear so much more is localism mm. coming uh, in the next few decades that we're all going to have to be much more local and, um, and to understand our local environment. I think this days of being massive global, globe-trotting citizens is coming to an end. Mm. And natural history, GCSE, along with the other subjects, framed the right way, can really help you to, to be more rooted and grounded in where you are. And I mm. think once you're rooted in your place and you know your place in your place, 
then, then you start to develop that sense of pride, that sense of community, that sense of protection about where you are. And all that will start to filter through. A lot of the natural history GCSE will be like soft power everywhere else, mm. if you see what I mean. Um, so if we can become really real champions for our local place, mm. I think we'll start making... A ha we'll have a happier society mm. as well as, as a more grounded one. So Do you think there's a potential tension there with sort of having a sense of place and knowing your place, as you put it there, with... The, an idea about social mobility, you know, moving up, moving out, moving on, getting on. I mean, is there a tension there? Uh, I, I hadn't thought of that, to be honest. I mean, um, you'd probably be a lot better to answer it than me, but I wouldn't have thought so. Uh, I, wouldn't, yeah. I can't see why understanding your local environment is in the tension with, no. with developing. I mean, everybody, all the... Coming down the line very, very fast is uh, the businesses and industry, the whole economy, having to understand nature much better. Mm. Biodiversity offsetting, biodiversity net gain, nature positive solutions, biodiversity accounting, all that stuff um, is, is a reality. Mm. And we're going to have to have people who can speak that language and understand and help whatever business it is, whether it's a hairdresser or you know the local energy company to make the right decisions for the natural world. So you can climb anywhere yes. if you want to, sure. but celebrate where you are and love where you are and understand why where you are is special. Yes, and place making so key, isn't it, in so, it's, so many uh, It's so key aspects. for up here. Yes, yeah, belonging, yeah. sense of belonging. Yeah. Um, Tim, I was going to bring you in on the, on the curriculum side, but mm. how can schools do some of the things that we're, we've been talking about, the kind of reimagining the public realm, collectivism, long-term thinking, Where's the, what are the vehicle mechanisms in the curriculum to help us do that? Yeah, so, so I think that's really important. I mean, I've written quite a few papers on what are the, the full set of opportunities right the way across the school curriculum mm. for in, including not only an understanding of, of the, the biosphere and the planet and, and what we're doing to it and how we should be behaving, but also how you can encourage uh, critical thinking as, uh, as, and, and, and strong sense of social responsibility amongst kids. Mm. Now, th there's a really fascinating paper by, by Hannah Arendt, uh, 1952, The Crisis of Education, um, which, which I, I have revisited a, n a number of times, and it's quite challenging because what it says is that, that education should be conservative uh, in its content and, and very progressive in its aims. And what she means is that if you, if you try and make the school curriculum controlled in every respect and saying, this is what comprises critical thinking, this is what consists of, of geograph geography, this is what consists of citizenship, and prescribe it in enormous detail, mm. then you're really telling people what to think rather than making them critical individuals. Mm. So what's uh, which is really, in, I mean, well, it's, I'm, mm. it's a challenging thought. Yeah. So I want to come straight back to what Joanne said right at the outset, which is that facts and information actually give you the moral heft, give moral heft to decision-making. Now, it's Michael Young who's talked about the importance of powerful knowledge. And so I think one of the things we have to do is to make sure that in all subjects, we're really focusing, focusing on what we know is powerful knowledge. Mm. And, and uh, where, where people say, oh, you know, education is just filling kids' f heads full of, cramming their heads full of facts. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, that would be really, really good. Because what we know from the latest brain science is that the more you fill kids full of facts, the more they can understand the relationships between them. Mm. The more they, can be, they have a foundation for critical thinking. The more that they have a love of reading, the more they'll be exposed to, the more ideas they will have in their minds to bring critically to bear on these kind of issues. But finding in that the sense of the, the common good, as well as personal interest, is absolutely fundamental. Yeah. Just, just, just at the risk of us agreeing far too much, I, mean, I, I, I get what you say when you say it would be great if, if kids' heads were full of facts, but I think there's also quite a dangerous narrative, given that we know that there are government ministers out there who would like nothing mm. more than kids to be yes. able to recite the names absolutely. of kings and queens going back to whenever yeah. else. Mm. Yeah. Frankly, I don't think that's a good use of education. Telling them where they can find no. that information or why it matters is incre incredibly important. But just to yeah, push back a little bit on the idea that just 
filling with facts, which I know isn't really... Yeah, and I, what, what I said was it shouldn't consist solely of that, but that is a vital foundation. You, you, and I think this is being lost a bit in, in a, lot of the, a lot of discourse now about how you use the internet in the context of, of learning. Don't worry, you don't need to remember things, you can always look them up. Uh, and that is not corroborated by good brain science and learning. What we find is that, you know, I wouldn't want to go to, to an elite professional in medicine who said, oh, I, I don't know, I can't remember. <laughs> um, and, uh, and Kurt Fisher's brilliant work on, on, on what we expect in elite thinkers is that they've internalised the facts and then brought them in relationship to one another and then stored those as memories. And that's what we should constantly do with kids. Now, I do that with very, very young kids and talk to them about things. And I even give them exam questions which you, uh, to eight-year-olds that you would expect to 16-year-olds to stimulate their thinking. And it's amazing what they come up with and the relationships that they develop. Sure. So we're beginning to... Uh, yes, Mary. Sorry. I, uh, this, I, I think this is a really important distinction to make because facts are really important. Mm. So, and I, I got a lot of flack at first from people saying, well, what's the point of knowing the name of a flower? You know, yeah, it's exactly. just facts, and yep. facts are unimportant. You know, you can just have your own name for it and you can mm. still love it. True. Um, but there is something else going on. Uh, at the University of Derby showed that Unless you have an emotional connection to the world around you, not just a factual one, you won't sustain yeah. in the future. So if you're trying to produce citizens which are environmentally aware, uh, aware of nature, aware of their responsibility towards the natural world, you can't do it just by teaching them facts. Mm. You have to do it mm. by helping them have an emotional relationship yeah. with nature, mm. which is exactly why I was so keen that we had some kind of cultural importance and understanding mm. of nature mm. um, in there, but it got taken out. Um, because I, in, in a way, I, I, I'd much rather people knew the names of flowers and didn't, or birds and didn't, but it's not enough in itself. Mm. Yeah. And so we have to have an enrichment around it. So. And that's why I keep coming sure. back to this phrase, we need a, a conversation with the natural world again, that like you understand each other and you can exchange mm. information, if you like. And, and I think that's absolutely vital, or it won't sustain into the future. Mm. Were um, young people involved in the framing of the curriculum, this particular degree, this degree, this particular <laughs> qualification, and, and indeed others? What, what's the role um, of young people in that? Well, again, back to the process. Um, Mary and uh, Caroline went to see Michael Gove, who was then Secretary of State for Environment. Um, in the room was a, an advisor, Tim Loynig. Um, both Michael and Tim said, you need to go to an exam board. So very kindly, uh, Tim gave Caroline and um, Mary my name. And we, we then sat down and discussed stuff. Now, the first bash at the content, we didn't do in conjunction with young people. Mm. I went to our archive, we've got exam papers going back to the 1890s, and I looked at qualifications which we used to have, which were vibrant, but have been abandoned. Zoology, mm. botany. We used to have those as yeah, qualifications for 16-year-olds and 18-year-olds. And I looked at the content, and then, then scanned, re really did, <laughs> scanned all of the discourse about, about natural history and about conservation, although we Mary was really hot on my case and said, don't bloody make it about just about conservation. Um, and we got an outline listing on that basis, pitched at the right level. And, and that's what we began to use to lobby. We then, we then consulted on that. And many young people were part of that as I said, that very widespread consultation. It's, I guess, and part of a wider discussion around the, the power relationships in education. I mean, education is about power, sure. knowledge is power. Mm. Um, in many other spheres of life, things are co-produced, co-curated, yeah. yeah. co- uh, and uh, we were ch chatting earlier with the young people who yeah. are having their, their parallel uh, conference next to us. What would they want to see in the reframe of education? And they wanted to be much more involved in determining what, what they learned. Mm. I was going to say that, that there's a fantastic organisation called Teach the Future, which is mm. young people who are exactly trying to um, influence the curriculum. And they've come up with um, a Climate Emergency Education Act, which Nadia Whittam, who's the Labour MP for Nottingham, is introducing as a private member's bill. So I think, mm. I, I, mean, I totally agree with you. I think that's a really exciting area. Mm. Um, I mean, whether it would have been appropriate here, 
or at what stage it would have been appropriate, mm. I, I'm not sure. But I, mm. I do think that there's yeah. that sense of co-production and co-ownership and so forth is, is really exciting and something that we should be supporting. Because oh, environmental politics and c culture can be very polarising and, and there's an intergenerational... Uh, battle going on. If you think about Greta Thunberg boycotting school, you know, Greta, on Fridays the school strike. So, yeah, so the, the figure of Thunberg against the adults yeah. who are doing nothing and not listening. Yeah. Uh, how, how do we? What, what do you make of the intergenerational politics of? Okay. Well, we did, again in terms of the consultation, we really made sure that both youth groups and young people were part of the consultation. Mm. And if they'd said anything that we considered negative and 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 that we were on the wrong track, we absolutely would have responded to it. But actually, they were really okay. very, very aligned with what we were doing. But this in issue of intergenerational conflict, I think, is extremely important and something which concerns me a great deal. Uh, I'm very old now, but I, was, I became very concerned about what was happening to the biosphere when I was very young. Mm. Um, and I've retained that concern and been active all, all my life. So I, I got very concerned when, when I began to hear these messages that it's you, the older generation, that, that have let us down. Mm. And I think it conceals, a com it actually causes the concealment of a couple of really, really difficult things. Um, the, the first thing, thing is that, that, that um, I think we've got to have a, a cross-generational uh, coalition of understanding around the common interest and the common good. Mm. And, and that actually did play out in the discussion with ministers. We said, look, if, if the state approves a natural history GCSE that young people are calling for and will help them better understand what's occurring out there in terms of degradation and, uh, and what's happening to org organisms other than humans, it shows that the state cares about that. Mm. And, and actually that, that, was, that, was, that was quite powerful. Right. Okay. Yep. The second thing that I think is important, and this is in terms of, of concealing things that shouldn't be concealed, what is it that's brought about this? Is it just the deliberate acts of old people, or is it the way we've found ourselves configuring our economy, mm -hmm. and the way in which our global economy, and the way in which we operate day by day? It's more that than the willful mm -hmm. neglect of individuals, and those economic relations ain't changing much for young people. Mm -hmm. And if we say it's just about the fact you're young, you care, and the fact that you're old, you don't, it just means that nobody's looking at the things that really have caused the problem mm. and need to be changed. And that's really serious. Sure. Yep, yep. Response there. Um, with, with, continuing with this polarisation theme, so there, there will be people like many younger people and, uh, who, who want us to go further and faster. Uh, and there'll be... And, 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 and Extinction Rebellion on one end of the debate. On the other end of the debate, you've got protesters against ULES, against low traffic neighbourhoods, and that's beginning to gather ahead of steam about yeah. climate deniers, conspiracy theorists, and so on. So how do we, what's your response to that? How do we equip young people perhaps to engage with that terrain? I think it needs to be unpacked a little bit mm. because I, I think it's certainly the case that any green transition can't be made on the backs of the poorest people. Mm. And there was a concern, albeit it was an exaggerated one, but there was a legitimate concern with ULEZ around for those people who would be affected, and it was far fewer than the <laughs> people like to pretend, but for those who were affected, some people genuinely couldn't afford um, to make the transition because the scrappage scheme wasn't as generous as Sadiq Khan had originally wanted it to be. So I think when we are talking about this transition, unless we're providing the finance and the support to enable that transition to happen in a way that doesn't hit the poorest, then we're going to be in a really dark place because there are so many politicians out there and others who are going to leap on this as an example mm. of, you know, and it's already happening. Mm. I mean, the way in which Sunak, frankly, has weaponized climate change as the latest culture war, I think is absolutely mm. obscene. And the idea that he would stand there and say that it's, it's, it's for working people that he's now decided to remove the requirement on landlords to properly insulate their homes. I mean, excuse me, it's mm. those people on lower incomes who are the tenants mm. who are now going to be in freezing cold properties because the landlords don't have to ins insulate them. So I, I think we just really need to not accept some of those arguments on 
on, you know, on the face mm. of it, on, at face value, but really unpack what they're about and make sure that absolutely in this transition, social justice has to be absolutely front and centre of it. Mm. Sure. Mary, did you want to come in there? Or... <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> But I, I want to make a different point, yeah. if, you can, if I can. Um, I think it's really interesting that as soon as we have a talk like this, it always goes to climate change. Mm. And we take our eye off the, the natural world. And a lot of people think the natural world is all about climate change, and it ain't all about climate change. It's about biodiversity. It's about life on mm. Earth. And not one damn thing we do to try to help reduce the impact of climate change will work unless we protect natural ecosystems and wildlife. It won't work. Mm. But always the narrative goes to just talking about climate change and everybody immediately gets stuck into mm. ULES and mm. turning, you know, not flying and all that stuff. And I, I think a lot of this conflict comes out of this confusion, this, this lack of clarity about what is, what, what actually we're talking about. Mm. And I think that anybody, whether you're in primary school now or you're 90, will understand that we have to have a healthy living world to thrive. And, that, and, mm. and climate is part of that. It's fundamentally interrelated, but we always forget and, and make the wildlife side of it, the natural history side of it, the nature side of it, a kind of, oh yes, and that's nice as well. Mm. You know. mm. so, so I wrote recently, I, we're, we're quite big at our organisation, 6,000 people, and so there's quite a nice internal discussion often. So I wrote mm. a piece recently about um, why, why on, on certain days, as I walk towards my bike when it's really cold and I have to cycle uh, 10 miles into Cambridge, I'm subject to three things that all human beings are subject to, which is sloth, prevarication and denial. Mm. Okay? Mm. It's, just, it's just a lot easier to go in the car. Mm. Uh, oh, I'll, uh, oh, I'll drive today, but I'll cycle tomorrow. Prevarication. And denial, oh, it won't really make a difference, will it? Because mm. it's just me. But I always, whenever I get, I, I feel that, which are very human things, and I feel, when it's really cold, I feel, as I'm walking towards the bike shed, <laughs> I think all you're thinking about is you. If you, if you give in to sloth, prevarication and denial. You, and, and that's really important to have those discussions at school with young people about mm. what are the consequences of your actions. Mm. And if I'm not doing it, I mean, how can I encourage other people to yeah. do it? I was chatting to my kids over dinner last night about, about this, um, and they said, well, uh, the curriculum is one thing, but the whole school approach yeah, really is just as important. important. So yes. if you're, you, you, what, what, what food are you eating at school? What's, mm. what's the canteen Absolutely. offering? How are you getting to school? Is there recycling in the, and, you know, what's the, what's the, how do you use the green space around the school? Yeah. And I don't know how many schools are able or equipped or have the time to do that kind of thing. But well, and also they're subject to such amazingly different drivers that pull them in different directions. So I think I mentioned this to you a while ago, Caroline. This hilarious situation that I ran into well before COVID, we're in the department, where there were two teams sitting next to each other. Okay? One was the walk-to-school team, <laughs> encouraging all schools and communities mm. to get the kids to walk to school. The next team was the academisation team, which actually was encouraging people to go to a school of their choice, possibly at some distance. Yeah. Mm. And they didn't talk to each other. <laughs> but that second team resulted in massive amounts of large four-wheel drives mm. clogging up our cities and our country lanes. Yeah. yeah. Well, that seems a very good point to move to q and I'm, I'm being directed to do that as well. So um, let me just invite you to thank the panel first. Thank you very much. And uh, questions. We have roving mics. A uh, woman at the back there. Where are the mics? Oh, sorry. There we are. Thank you. And I did cycle here today because <laughs> I thought I ought to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a candidate, yeah. <laughs> I cycle everywhere. People know this. <laughs> yeah. Hi there. Thank you. That was a um, brilliant discussion, really interesting. And um, I just want to say, as a side note, that three of my aunties went to, they're in their 70s and they went to school in Colchester. One became a zoologist, one a botanist, and one a geologist. <laughs> 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 
Um, <laughs> there we go. And um, yeah, I've heard Caroline talk about um, this GCSE for years, and it's really exciting, and I think it's a, a brilliant idea, and I really hope it comes into action soon. And I was just thinking how brilliant it would be for us to have a nature corridor from very small children who see the world in the minutiae of the ladybirds and the blades of grass. But then you have the GCSE, but a continuation of that through primary school. But um, what I really wanted to say was that I think as environmentalists, we've had a big journey in persuading people that climate change and biodiversity loss is a real thing that will affect us here in this country as well as around the world. And we're there now. And like you say, Mary, um, young children really understand the issues that we're facing. But it's paralyzing the fear and anxiety you can feel in the face of it. And would it be something to really consider in the curriculum from a very young age to make people understand that actually we need people from all disciplines, all professions, all different walks of lives who can be so innovative and creative in, on a huge scale, but also on a tiny scale in how we actually really practically address these different things to make people feel excited to do GCSEs and all sorts of subjects, but bring in S solutions to the issues that we face, yeah. but to have that throughout the curriculum. And I just wondered if that's if there's any thinking on that at this stage. Yeah. So. Okay. While well, the mic's going round, could somebody... If I can just say yes, that so that the paper I referred to earlier is one which we're using within Cambridge University Press and Assessment to audit all qualifications to include uh, sustainability and other themes within all subjects in the form of contexts, in the form of... of uh, parts of questions and exams and so on. Yeah. And that, that work is underway. Okay, sounds good. Question that um, Mark, who's right there. Um, thank you. Um, I've been a, a teacher at the Sixth Form College for 33 years now, and um, I've got a couple of points to make. First of all, um, I think it's absolutely right that um, um, ecology, um, the biodiversity and climate crisis, they're, they're, they, they're cross-curriculum. It's not just, just in the, the excellent natural history GCSE, but in, across the whole curriculum. Um, but, but one of the, the problems I have as an A-level teacher, and I'm going to address the elephant in the room, is, is funding, or rather the underfunding um, of education. Um, and um, Put it like this, in, in my sixth form college, we have lost in real terms 60% mm. of our funding per student mm. since 2010. Mm. Now, what that does is reduce lesson times. What it does is narrow the curriculum within subjects mm. to just getting them through exams with easy skills, hoops, and so forth, because you've got less time to teach them. So um, we have to address the issue of funding. Mm. Um, one of the battles I'm having at the moment is the battle of the refectory, for example. Um, we did a tutorial on, on the climate emergency last week, um, and then straight after tutorial's lunch, they go into the refectory, they use wooden disposable utensils, plastic cups, um, you know, um, plastic trays because they don't use plates anymore because they don't employ people to wash them up because they can't afford it. Um, this is common across schools, and don't even get me started on the quality of the food, but that's a different issue. But this we is won't, because we're going to need to bring in more questions, but yes. <laughs> so can we address the issue of funding? Yeah. Can we address the issue of funding? And then I'm looking for more hands while we, while we do yes, that. Yes, we can address okay. yes. the issue okay. of funding. And I think we're entering a new world where blended finance... Uh, that private money is going to have to be joined with public money to make um, nature education, environmental education, all this stuff we've been talking about, actually a reality. Make it even part of your environmental goals or sustainability goals or whatever it is. But we need to tap into that very large, in, in some cases, private money and put that back into the, into, the, into the education system so that you don't have to worry about funding, that you will have in your school the teachers who are funded to train properly to teach this GCSE, and that you have the money to take kids to where they need to go to learn about it. But we've got to do it with a blended finance model. <laughs> oh, you can't get away from it, Karen? Um, well, you can. If you, it depends on the kind of government you elect, doesn't it? And, and I appreciate that in any time soon, perhaps we're not going to get away from it. But I, I really worry, having seen what happens when you've got private companies mm. funding universities and what happens then to what gets taught in those universities, it's really sinister. Mm. And I don't think we should be under any illusion 
that there are forces out there who are not on our side for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, my heart goes out for you to you mm. being a sixth form college because I am furious in the way in which sixth form colleges are so penalised under our system in yep. a way that, you know, that, that, that secondary schools mm. aren't and mm. your funding per, per pupil is so much less mm. and yet your outcomes are so much better. I, I mean, you, you know, there's so much that we need to mm. sort out, but I, I would just be slightly resistant would yeah, and be, and, <laughs> and be assured that, that whilst we are idealists, I think in a good sense, the three of us, we, we all also engage with these very practical issues and we've, whilst we don't hold the, the solution to increasing school funding for the right things, we, we have endlessly pushed and, mm. and lobbied in respect of that. Um, and, and my own view is is informed by a guy called Donald Mack, who was a brilliant HMI in Scotland. And he framed it in a way in which I think we all ought to be, have at the forefront of our minds. We actually take away the liberty of young people uh, from the age, age of five to now, now the age of 18. We take their liberty away and we say they have to be, we lock them in institutions and we fortunately lock them in those institutions with professionals concerned for their learning. But we've got to make sure that what they learn there is of real benefit to them and society and is properly funded. Right. And we make that point time after time after time. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So who would not want to see greater funding of our schools and I think through uh, the state resource that we need. Um, the woman in the middle with the blue scarf. Thank you. All for being here, and I come really excited. I'm a biology teacher that loves the idea of a natural history one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we are going to fight you. Um, but what I'm more concerned with is the entire GCSE banking transmission model of education is antiquated and not preparing our students for sustainable living, for sustainable life. Um, it's really inadequate education. I'm in a classroom and I see government policies say all these lovely, beautiful words about sustainability and integrating it by 2020. Um, nothing gets to the classroom. Our children are either apathetic or just beat down by the amount of facts, but it's not connecting the facts. And so how would you suggest we can actually reform the education to be educational? And that's from a loving mm. secondary teacher that likes my job. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, but we've addressed quite a lot of that, haven't we, in, uh, in what we were, we were saying about the public value? No? No? Oh, OK. Well, in that case, I'll, I'll hand over to... Uh, you don't want to have a second stab at that. What you guys have talked about so far is within the GCSE model, and I, within mm. this model, I love the natural history GCSE idea. What I don't like is the entire GCSE yeah. model. Mm. Got it. Mm. OK. Mm. Well, I think there are questions, aren't there, about the role of exams at that age anyway, now that young people stay on at school until they're 18. And if you're going to spend so much time on external examinations at that age, there is an opportunity cost in terms of what you're not actually teaching them because you're teaching them how to pass the GCSE. So I think there is a much bigger conversation that could be had about, about how we monitor and assess young people as they go through schools, how much of that needs to be an external public examination. I can sort of feel um, Tim's eyes boring into me. No, no, no. <laughs> he agrees. No, no. Um, not but not, cri not critically. No, no, no. I mean, I, I, we, we, well, I, personally, I've done a great deal of research on this. We've compared the systems in high-performing systems. Um, there's a, if you just Google Oates and Suto uh, GCSE, you'll find a report on that comparing it. But what we found is that in 21 high-performing systems, all of them have high-stakes assessment at 16. 14 of them have exams. But crucially, very few have the scale of exams that we mm. have. Oh, yeah. and the amount of assessment time at 16. And therefore, I think there are legitimate questions about whether we should be assessing so many subjects yeah. and so extensively. Yeah. Um, and and I, I do th I, I, I'm completely against people who say we should abolish the GCSE because mm. nobody else has them. Actually, almost all countries do have something similar. But the balances are often different. And I think we need that quest the, a discussion about balance yeah. and washback effect into the nature of the learning. I think I've got time. No, I've got to, I've got to stop. Sorry? Oh, it's so we're at five. We're, we're fine for another five minutes, I think. Okay. Oh, lady in the middle. Lady in the middle. <laughs> How, 
Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this interesting discussion. I'm from a student parliament at the University of Essex. So there is a lot of students uh, in UK from different countries. And in some countries, uh, ecology is not studied enough. So should universities or even government uh, make a course for international students who are not familiar with um, and like ecology and how to protect environment, should the government create this course or should universities uh, okay. do this? And also uh, because Let's of global warming and uh, there may, uh, may be even more migration also because of war in Ukraine and ecology suffer. You could see uh, when Kachowska dam was uh, blown up. So uh, a lot of older people uh, d doesn't know how to, for example, sort rubbish, doesn't know how okay. to protect uh, environment a lot. So does local government need, can create this uh, course for uh, older people and how okay. this? Let me put Thank that to the panel. Thank you so much. You have a, how, how we well, if you were going to okay. do it, I would make it open as well to people in the local community as well, because yeah. just as Tim was saying yeah. that so many people, including myself, were saying that, you know, we wish that this greater education around natural history and so forth that had been available when we were young. If you're going to have some sort of course later on for, for example, international students, then let's open it up to, to people in the community more broadly mm. because it feels like there's an, an awful yeah. lot of us who would like more information. Mm. So we talked about GCSE, but, but also the paper I described emphasised the extent to which we need a new catalogue of vocational qualifications. Mm. I mean, mm -hmm. there are so many people who are going to find themselves at the age of 40 with two or three kids with a mortgage mm. in, in, in an industry which is a f full of stranded assets with nowhere to go. And, and those are stranded workers. Yes. And at the moment, we don't have the, the, the qualifications to enable them to switch to industries which mm. are more sustainable, more oriented towards green industries. Mm. We don't have those qualifications. And, and therefore, we're looking at what those qualifications could and should consist That's of. so important because 50% of young people aren't going to university They're going, and, and amongst them are going to be the, the yeah. workforce for these new green industries and, yes, absolutely. and uh, the skill base for that group is, yeah. is, is vitally important. But it's not only, it's, it's absolutely for vocational preparation for those not yet workers, but I'm also very concerned about those who are going to be in, in stranded workers mm. because of, they've trained for things which yes. are now no longer sustainable. Right. Okay. I think we need to end it there, but uh, thank you so much for your time and your questions, and thank you again to our panel. Thank you. Thank you very much.